My name is Eric Kendi, and I'm a doctoral student at the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes at Arizona State University. Uh, and I've had the real pleasure of getting to know a number of posters to give you a bit of a digital poster tour uh, of the voluminous uh, collection of posters that have been gathered on the website. I'm doing this under the theme of socio-technical integration. Uh, and the goal with that is to give you a bit of insight into a similar experience we had with a previous workshop, a uh, workshop we did last May at Arizona State University, but also make some connections to other work that's being done uh, in the posters displayed here. So there will be a few of you that I'll be referencing in the posters. And so my hope is in the question and answer period uh, that as you're thinking of what you want to bring up, that it's something that we're able to have a conversation out here. I'm happy to field questions, but we have a lot of expertise that I'll be referring to in the room. So to give you a bit of insight into this tour and where uh, socio-technical integration is coming from, at a really general level, what we're talking about is the combination of, on one hand, the social, the political, the humanistic issues with, on the other hand, the technical and scientific questions. And so in that sense, socio-technical integration we're taking quite broadly to be any sort of effort to bring together those two, to think about how the two interact, uh, or to debate techniques and approaches to melding those two. We don't take them to necessarily be totally separate entities. Uh, that's a fuzzy space and they aren't clean cut in their division. But projects that incorporate some element of both of those. And what I'm going to sketch out for you in the next few minutes uh, is three different clusters of posters that I saw on the website. Three different themes that emerged and issues that the posters were engaging with. Now you'll have to strap in because this will be a lightning speed tour, but I'm hoping that it will whet your appetite for a bunch of what's out there. And to that end, whenever I reference a poster, I have the number posted. So if you're looking for something to scribble down quickly so that you can find it later, just write down that three digit number. A really cool thing about this meeting has been the fact that we all pretty much agree on this framework. Despite the fact that we come from a wide range of disciplines, from various disciplinary backgrounds uh, and training centers, from different research groups, and working on different issues, uh, it's pretty neat that in virtually every presentation, we've been talking about the complexity of problems that we're trying to engage with, and the difficulty that arises from uncertainty, from having to bring multiple domains together, uh, and from having to work across communities and disciplines. And socio-technical integration is all about that. It's about bringing together these two different elements that we've often unfortunately separated in the past and seeing how they're both relevant to complex problem solving. So the first cluster of posters that I want to talk about is about this notion of bridging that gap or bringing disciplines together. And there were a few themes that held true between all of the posters. They all talked about the way that science and scientists uh, and academics have a role to play in bettering the world. That it's not enough to just know the world, but that we need to know how to change it and furthermore take action on that. They also had a real sort of pluralism uh, thesis in play, that there's value to combining different disciplines, to bring in together different domains and perspectives and ideas, uh, and that the work that we do is better when we have that plurality of perspectives. And then finally, there was a theme in these three posters uh, about the notion of having a shared concept that you can rally around. Even if you didn't define it in a precise way that was the same for all the projects, if you had some terms that people could come together around, you could achieve some sort of unity of vision. The first poster is the one that I've been most involved with, uh, and this is why we gave this session the socio-technical label. So here we're talking about a meeting that we had last May at Arizona State, uh, where we did a very similar project to what's going on right here. We chose about a half dozen communities and then a bunch of other representatives to come together, uh, all based on the fact that they integrated something social and something technical, whether it was in descriptive frameworks or whether it was in some sort of normative or kind of uh, pragmatic approach to integrating. And we used a specific framework for trying to find some shared ground and some conversation space, which was looking at their form, means, and ends as theories or concepts. Basically, what they try to do, how they try to do it, and why they do it, why they care about the socio-technical integration. 
And the result after about a week of these deliberations, very full days, was that there was a commonality, there was a theme and a field that emerged, and that we were better in conversation with each other. So I think we might have similar aspirations at this kind of event, that we can improve each other's practice through conversation and critique. This kind of notion showed up in other posters as well that I was a bit less familiar with. Uh, I really liked this one for the way that it involved using a holistic concept of Earth uh, and the environment as a rallying point for different projects and different groups. The idea was that you didn't necessarily need to pin down a specific definition of a term like the Anthropocene. You could use the pluralistic ways that different groups identified that term you could use that as a rallying point and a conversation starter that created a safe space for groups to engage and converse about their activities. Another one that you'll be familiar with after this morning was uh, the concept of science of team science. And Britt Holbrook put together a poster that used an analogy of a group of islands to explore this concept. So science of team science is studying the way that small groups collaborate uh, particularly in scientific practice. And what he did, did throughout the poster was looked at some of the core concepts that needed to be evaluated philosophically, but the way that variation among the communities on their definitions of these concepts and their understandings, the way that that variation resulted in this island-like analogy where you had a chain of islands who interacted and could engage with each other, but had distinct ecosystems within them. So we've talked a bit about approaches at bringing disciplines together. A second theme of posters involved specific tactics for doing socio-technical integration. They varied quite tremendously in forms, uh, but that variation was important. So there was one obvious chasm first off that was the descriptive versus normative or facilitative kind of gaps, where some of these tools, like the toolbox project that Michael shared, uh, was all about facilitating and enabling and empowering conversation, whereas theories like interdis or interactional expertise, rather, are much more of a descriptive tool for understanding socio-technical integration and in play. So, to take a look at one we're familiar with already, uh, Michael just did a great workshop at lunch about the Toolbox Project, where we had a chance to try out some of these instruments. And so this is a very facilitative approach to socio-technical integration, where you're able to take concepts from philosophy and port them into a science lab, where you're able to add the philosophical rigor to topics of technical interest. I also found this particular poster neat for the way that it uh, hinted at and talked about the evaluation that goes into the toolbox project. So this isn't simply a project uh, all about doing it, they have a measurement and follow-up component where they trace some of this longitudinally and see the impact that it's had on groups. By contrast, a very descriptive tool that was presented in the posters uh, was that of trading zones. So this is the notion of creating a space where you have communities who come together, they share time and skills and have conversations with each other, and they develop slowly a language that they each share. And this initially emerges around specific concepts or potentially ideas that they give language to, but eventually builds up into a language that different communities can plug into, a trading zone that they can all partake in. And so this is very much a descriptive tool. It's not so much about facilitating trading zones, though you can use the theory for that. It's a way of plugging into and studying existing socio-technical collaboration and interdisciplinary work. It's also worth mentioning the uh, theory of interactional expertise, which is out of Cardiff University with two sociologists there. They talk about linguistic fluency in collaborations. So as part of positing a much larger framework for understanding expertise, they suggest that it's possible for people to become interactional experts. That is, practice the language enough to get the tacit knowledge, but in the absence of practicing the tangible skills. So if we all went down the road and hung out with the physicists for a year, we could pick up some of the physics language, uh, but we really should not be let anywhere near the Large Hadron Collider. That would be dangerous. This again is a descriptive tool, 
but it can be used for more facilitative kinds of roles. So this shows up a lot in patient activist groups, uh, like the Epstein AIDS activists that are referred to sometimes in science technology studies. This is where a group of patients learned the language of a medical profession and were able to challenge the doctors uh, and the clinicians on the way that trials were being run around AIDS medicine. So we've seen a group of approaches and tools. We've seen some ways of going about integrating disciplines. A third set of uh, slides and PowerPoints I'd like to talk about are those that relate to epistemology or ways of knowing. And there are another three that I'll highlight here. It's particularly important to practicing socio-technical integration that you understand that there's a plurality of epistemologies in play. They involve a lot of different perspectives and paradigms, and you need to be able to relate to multiple communities as you bring those two different worlds into discussion and dialogue. They can vary substantially, and there's a need to strike a balance between respecting in a sort of ecosystems model like we heard about yesterday, but also being able to talk critically about and engage with and really understand what different epistemologies look like. So there were three slides that talked about different ways of knowing in socio-technical integration. The first was uh, the project that gave birth to the socio-technical integration label, uh, which is the STIR project. And this was a pretty cool experiment that's ongoing. They've done it in over 30 countries now in far more labs, where they take a humanist or a social scientist someone like a philosopher or political scientist, they take that person and dump them into a hard science lab for a 12-week period and force them to interact with the scientists. And it's really kind of a cool example because we hear reports of these philosophers or uh, political scientists going into a physics lab or a nanotechnology lab or a biology lab. And they get there and start asking using a semi-structured interview protocol what decisions are being made, what options the scientists had, uh, and the scientists usually for the first half of the stir immersion just straight up say, oh, we didn't make any decisions. We, we did what we needed to. We followed the protocols. But over the course of a 12-week engagement, they're able to help the scientists reflect on the ways that they make decisions in the lab, the different considerations uh, that come into discussions and practice, and the ways that they could choose different alternatives. It's not a sort of invasive study in that they're trying to change any of this. They're simply trying to encourage reflection among the scientists. And in a second cool thing, this has spurred on more productive science activity in the lab too. So in addition to creating more responsibility around the scientific outcomes and creating more reflexivity in the lab practice, there's actually been a number of documented cases of patents and papers being spun out of this kind of engagement, where that process of reflecting and engaging with options has led the scientists to consider new and novel ways of solving problems. I'll admit I'm a little bit remiss to put up the uh, most colorful slide of the conference simply because I have a degree in knowledge integration. Um, but the point of this slide is really well taken. This was the one that we saw yesterday and talked a little bit about uh, how knowledge ecology offers a more pluralistic kind of interpretation of bringing together different epistemic communities uh, than a knowledge integration framework might if it's interpreted in a more monolithic kind of way. And that point is really important, that there's a role for epistemological pluralism in integrating and bringing different epistemologies together in conversation. I'll mention just one more here, uh, so that we can hopefully get back onto time a bit more. Um, this is the project of socially relevant philosophy of science, uh, which comes out of a concern among philosophers that it's difficult in their institutional barriers to doing contemporary, socially relevant, uh, and practically involved philosophy. A lot of the institutional reward structures, a lot of the tenure and promotion kinds of structures, the journals, the teaching and philosophy, uh, felt to this group of philosophers like it discouraged any sort of real world, engaged, better the world kind of work. And so the movement of socially relevant philosophy of science is trying to make room for this kind of practice where you're able to bring philosophical insights and types of questions 
to conceptually clarifying and wrestling with important real world issues and making space for this kind of work. Not every philosopher needs to do it, but the project is all about allowing this kind of work to take place. So real lightning tour through nine presentations, but enough to show us a couple of things. First of all, projects talking about socio-technical integration are quite diverse in their makeup. Everything from descriptive tools to major efforts to bring communities together and alter their practice. But there seems to be significant value in bringing them together in an intentional kind of way, in fostering these kinds of converse, conversation spaces where we're able to engage with each other around our methods, our questions, uh, and our types of solutions that we're pursuing. It allows us to be more rigorous about our work, and it allows us insight that we couldn't have within our narrowly defined communities. If you're interested in this particular kind of socio-technical integration and problem solving, if you're passionate about bringing the socio-political and humanistic world together with the techno and scientific, I'd encourage you to check out this project, and I have a link on the next slide. Um, but feel free to keep touring, uh, and I hope you gathered a couple of posters of interest that you'll be able to go back and visit later. So with that, thank you for bearing with me on this speedy tour of several posters, uh, and I look forward to any questions you might have, but I also really look forward to any conversations we can have among the audience with some of the authors of this po these posters, and perhaps even some of the themes from the previous talks that we just had. Thank you. Now I'm alone up here, so it looks like I'm facilitating the Q&A. So I'll throw it open and allow the mic runners to get their exercise for the session. Thank you, I don't wish to, to dominate, so apologies. Associate Professor Simon Atkinson from the University of Sydney. Um, We've looked at uh, the Infotechno socio and the Infotechno and the socio Infotechno as two very different couples. One is perhaps the cyber physical and one the cyber social. And um, so we're delighted to see uh, the emergent work that you're, you're doing. But they have very different, as I presume you're saying, um, responses to integration. And certainly some of our analysis has shown that integration is actually antithetical to resilience and agility within the organizations. And I wonder if there's anything you'd like to say about that. So there were a couple of, of really valuable things there. Uh, the first is the asymmetry of potential integration. And what I'd reflect on from our experience with the workshop and ongoing collaboration between these kinds of groups um, is that it's hugely benefited by having folks who participate in multiple communities already and who are attuned to both social and technical dimensions. Um, so we're able to overcome some of that asymmetry by the fact that many of the participants in this direct community have sort of a foot on either side. It's not to say that it totally uh, is symmetric in approach, but that's been one of our strategies at getting past it. Um, can you just remind me of the second part? About, oh yes, absolutely. So, Integration needs to come with a couple of caveats, and that was a hugely important part of the workshop that we did last May, was simply wrestle with what integration means, whether it's always a good, whether it's always something to be pursued, whether it can be done in ways that are respectful to the knowledge ecosystem and allow for a plurality of approaches rather than a monolithic kind of integration. Um, so what I'd, I'd highlight there is that this is very much an open question, and it's very contextually dependent. Um, that integration looks very different for each of these tools and each of these perspectives in practice. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Stewart from UNSW Canberra. Um, it strikes me that we're in real danger of constantly speaking to the converted in relation to these issues. I'm just thinking about some problems I'm involved with, um, trying to get public servants to talk to uh, residents, for example, in relation to town planning issues, that kind of stuff, where there's resistance 
to anything like this kind of engagement. Um, does your tour, does your work give any sense of the way we might overcome those sorts of problems? That's an important question, thank you. Uh, so there are a couple of dimensions that come to mind in responding to that. The first is to say that there are some of these projects that are very much interested in getting beyond that. So the STIR project in particular, while it relies on labs being willing to give access to the social or humanists or social scientists, um, they're actively soliciting cases where they can get involved in labs that haven't previously engaged with this kind of thought. Um, so you can see tools like the Toolbox project or like STIR being used to actively stir up new communities uh, that haven't previously agreed with these concepts. You can also see work to engage with those who aren't already converted from something like socially irrelevant philosophy of science, uh, which has actually been criticized a few times from within the philosophy discipline, um, from folks who want to preserve a certain status quo of traditional philosophy. So some of the projects are able to get beyond preaching to the choir by either engaging with new constituent groups um, or re-engaging with their disciplinary communities who might not have entirely accepted this. That said, I think there's a second element of that worth considering. Um, and it's something that's in my mind frequently at meetings like this, where there's a lot of conceptual agreement at a sort of high level and in the way we frame our questions and problems. So, as I mentioned earlier, virtually every presentation from this podium has started with some sort of appeal to complexity to these kinds of interdisciplinary kinds of problems. Um, and we need to be careful, I think, in finding those layers of agreement to be able to poke and prod them a little bit uh, more thoroughly and deeply to see whether some of our terms that are superficially or as obsensibly the same, to make sure that we're actually coming from similar points uh, at a deeper theoretical level and deeper practical level. Um, so I totally agree with that concern and I think that's a very valid point. Um, I think we also need to be able to leverage that concern to our benefit and make sure that we're not assuming that we're preaching to a room full of converts uh, or that we homogenize the important diversity uh, and variety of perspectives in this kind of a diverse group. Thank you. We'll do one more and then we'll let you run to the tea break. Uh, Liz Bolton from ANU Fenner School. Um, I'm just wondering, I heard one critique of the concept of wicked problems that it said um, really it's just a legitimate part of the political process when, you, when you're talking about complexity, that throughout history there have always been interest groups with different values and different wants and a, a legitimate political process involves negotiations and discussions between all those different groups and resources, limitations and all the rest of it, so it's just politics. Um, so perhaps, do you think that, um, I, you know, open this just really a comment, that if the political and democratic discourse with the public process is broken, then it, that job of, of um, working between all those interest groups and teasing all this stuff out is being pushed, um, sort of almost outsourced in a way. Um, it's just a thought. The who ought to do it question is particularly poignant in socio-technical integration because often this can get loaded onto the scientists as important parts of their communication duties without supporting the institutional arrangements to make that happen. Um, or for folks coming from uh, other areas uh, in speaking with philosophers who want to do this kind of socially engaged work, um, folks have told them in the past, well, you just need to maintain two CVs, a traditional philosophy CV and then do a full CV worth of public engagement. And so where these people come from, who does this work and how we support it uh, is a hugely important question. And there's also an element um, that I'll leave you with as you head out to the tea time, which is just to say that we have a propensity to see every problem or at least frame every problem in grant proposals and journal articles as being new and novel and never before seen. And I think what that question and comment hints at is the way that complexity and wicked problems, while they certainly do arise from the way we've built systems upon systems, are part of the kinds of problems we've grappled with solving for a long time. Um, and in some ways, relabeling them simply to create a novel proposal uh, does a disservice to that uh, tradition of problem solving and some of the resources we can draw upon. 
I'll leave you with that. But thank you so much for being an attentive audience, and enjoy the break.